Three recurring donations. Thank you, Stephen J., Adam C., and, and Benjamin C. Much appreciated, guys. Um, I noticed between the several, uh, the, the, the several recurring guys, the people that give uh, donations um, on, a, on a monthly basis or more, I forget what it is actually, it probably is about that. We are, we are doing, um, uh, that really cuts, or adds, I should say, supports us well on a, you know, sort of stabilizing basis. basis. But anything else you want to do, folks, please, please feel free. Just move this computer a little further over. Happier, Mr. Producer. David uh, uh, B. was a student of mine. He writes this interesting question. I'm going to um, put it up for you now. Here we go. Uh, this is a this is something that's so self-evident and and such a, in a sense a disaster. And yet I just ignore it when I talk about the principles related to painting. Um, and that is the distortion of <laughs> of the images. No matter what I send you, it's distorted. I mean, one of the funny things is that all of our monitors have a different. You know, unless we're all um, using the same uh, controls, we, <laughs> all of our monitors are different colors. So that's just the beginning of the craziness of, uh, of uh, the um, online imagery. I mean, all reproduction imagery of paintings is suspect. I mean, it's all something far, far, far less than the thing in the original. And, but yet, even if you go to a museum and see it in the original, the museums are putting such strange lights on things. I mean, if you get the paintings in the light in which they were painted, yet they're, they, they are frequently remarkably different. Now, their internal relationships can even be changed because of the color of light bulbs. You know, certain, uh, if you stood in a room lit by just red color, red light, there's a bunch of colors you wouldn't be able to make out. And that sort of thing is typical. There's losses because of artificial light. If I could, uh, you know, if I if I could follow in Gamel's um, um, train, uh, where he talked persistently about getting these guys to get to get paintings in walls that were not brighter than the pictures, not lighter than the pictures, and you know things that make the pictures just look black and dirty. Uh, you know, there's so many ways to show pictures at better advantage. The one of them I would do is actually the light. I'd tell you to put the paintings back in north light again. But we're talking about reproductions that come to you, and we use them all the time. I'm going to use some today just to talk about paintings. And, and um, so let's, let's listen to David, because I don't think I disagree with a single point he makes. We are indeed lucky. He must be responding to where I said that we're lucky to have access to such a wide variety of photographic reproductions of artwork. However, a photograph is not a faithful representation. In my judgment, it's pretty good at proportions, though subject to various distortions for sure. We'll talk about all these things, by the way, with images. Um, less good at light values and entirely untrustworthy when it comes to hue and chroma. This is why photography is an art form takes intuition, experience, and study to know how to make the machine do what you want. Well, I'm seriously needing this coffee cup to stay warm today. This is why photography is an art form. It takes intuition, experience, and study to know how to make the machine do what you want. Digital compression introduces all kinds of artifacts into digital images, which destroy edges, um, color transitions, and more. Many photographs available on the internet are scans made from old books. In my case here, I'm going to show some postcards where the links have faded disproportionately. There are several layers of inaccuracy between distorted links, distorted camera receptors, distorted screens, distorted files, etc. David, I'm feeling bad here. <laughs> you know, the principles that I'm talking about, they don't, they're not, they can be communicated to you via these images, or I wouldn't be doing this. But don't believe for one second that I believe a single one of the images I've sent you is actually true. It's in, in, in more than modest ways <laughs> to the, and, and, and even no matter which ways, they're even sort of like the painting in person, they're gonna be off in significant other ways. So 
He says, uh, David says, people love to fix up their digital images by adjusting the brightness, contrast, saturation, etc. And if they're and if they're adept with complex digital filters, and if they're adept, okay, with complex digital filters. One thing I have seen is that people will take paintings. Now, if you're going to use a painting in a reproduction or if it's going to be used online, by all means, adjust it, make it a, more, a better, more usable image, make it a better image that way. I would think that, you know, in the entire world of, uh, of illustration, that's a, it's a real legitimate thing. But the painting itself, the idea of paintings themselves, and that's a discussion that David, what David wants to bring up in a very different uh, uh, way in a second question, not for today. Uh, that is what's the value of paintings per se. Why paintings instead of just images of paintings, for example. But almost all these fix-ups are lossy operations as they lose information. Most, if not all, images on the internet have no claim to authenticity. And it's not difficult to find two reproductions of the same painting which look entirely different. And I could add, both look very plausible, too. This is not unique to the internet. Indeed, it's true of all types of reproductions that have ever been available. And that was a big discussion with Gamel himself, uh, with us. He would recommend the books that are using black and white images, but even black and white images are frequently bad. And we're talking about the values. But Gamble believed that the black and white, well, that, that, that certain black and white images were able to convey better the value scheme. Um, the, the value, yeah, let's leave it at that. Uh, so, other than perhaps the painted copy itself, so these you are know, reproductions, unless you have a painted copy. Uh, I do have a couple painted copies, and they're, even they look like they're the interpretation of the painter. You start wondering about it. <laughs> um, the one I, one that I've seen by A. LaSalle Ripley, I believe, in um, who was a museum school student, uh, the copy by of, of the Velasquez looks so plausible. It looks like you could learn something from it. There's no substitute for seeing real pictures with your own eyes, especially well-crafted pictures, such as those of the Boston painters, where the pigments and mediums used have not been compromised. So, David, no disagreement, even the least bit of disagreement about anything you're saying. Uh, there's probably more that could be said. The biggest problem I have with what people are doing is that they try to, you guys out there are trying to use images online to paint from. And... Um, even photographic images, that's why I said there's so much of this stuff is distortion before you ever get a hold of it. And what, what difference does that make? Except that, you know, to the extent that you are my middleman, my interpreter of nature, the camera's already blocking you. It's already making you a lesser uh, um, um, uh, value as an interpreter. So what can we safely learn, here's David's questions, what can we safely learn from digital reproductions? You know, so everything that I talked to you guys about regarding the Boston School, you can understand what I'm saying. I can show you edge relationships, for example. I can, the relative visual order of a painting isn't going to change very much, but I can at least get it across to you. And there are numbers of things like that. I show you, even in a painting, and I say it at times, even this painting, which may be far off, there still are chromatic differences in the in the painting itself, that are that can be seen to be relationally, um, that, that 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 can be seen in a relational way. That's the kind of stuff that doesn't it changes less. The whole thing is still distorted, but certain parts of that are changed less. I can't say though that it's that <laughs> that I, I'm saying that when I talk to you about the way we work, you guys are picking up on what I'm saying. If you work in front of yourself with the data I'm giving you, the knowledge I'm giving you, um, and don't be thinking of anything about some, in, and that's why you'd want to drop photographs in the first place. That's one of the reasons. Work from nature because what I'm telling you is is based on what we see when we look at nature with our own two eyes, not when we look through a, at a photograph. Uh, what should we try? To, what should we not try to learn from from them? Yeah, you, so you can't find exact color. You don't know what palette people use, depending on what image you have. You could just be wildly guessing about the palette. You'd be, I mean, that sort of stuff is uh, a reason to copy in person is to, if you, for example, I've copied a number of pictures in two cases in which it was to find out what their palette was. One was a Bougaro and one was a, uh, and one was a uh, Paxton. And uh, I found that 
what I couldn't, what I, I've said to you before, that what I couldn't copy in the Paxton uh, with Gamel's palette, I definitely could do almost anything that was in the Bouguereau with Gamel's palette. But the Paxtons required an upgrade into the into more ca the cadmiums uh, to get the intensity of the reds, for example, in the face. But so don't try to learn that. You can't. You really can't learn edges either. Reproductions are so little until you see a thing at full size. You don't really. Know. That's why I say about the Barg thing. The Barg. If you guys are looking at little reproductions and drawing them with pencils, that's not. That's not. That's not what nature. That's not what this guy's working with. You'll have a whole different set of ideas. But you would still say that on the whole, that reproduction has certain relationships that you might be able to... You might, you, you might be able to learn something. By, you know, you can always copy, but, but copying a painting done by a painter has so much more data for you to, to develop with, you know, to develop your skills with. If you're not, if you're not moving paint around the way they moved it around, what was that? I was uh, I was reading recently um, uh, a conversation about Bellini having run into Durer, and Durer had painted hair these 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 what appeared to be like the lines of this the very specific hairs, and 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 Bellini wanted to know if he had a brush for hairs. He wanted to own it. Would he sell it in his hairbrush? <laughs> and Durer pulled out a bunch of brushes. He said, "Just pick one of these. I'll show you how, and I'll show you how I make the hairs." But it wasn't a special hairbrush. It was just a brush. Um, but there are so many things about the reproductions that are in that class, too, that you wouldn't be able to... You know, one of the things, when you look at my own reproductions, and I'm not showing you any of them today, but you can't reproduce... I can't paint with the quality of light effect with pigments that they make it appear that I painted with in the reproductions. Now, it wouldn't... Relationally, in relation to other paintings, my light effects are going to stay stronger if they were stronger in person. That's a real thing. And of my paintings, the ones where the light effects are the most, most uh, eloquent, shall we say, they will remain a better looking painting despite those distortions, all the light pouring through the, um, the, the uh, screen. Um, in another way, of course, anything pouring through the screen, you know, no matter what it is, if it's that brilliant, just like in nature, you're gonna have to dumb it down anyway. You're gonna have to play relationally. And, uh, but that's no recommendation to learn to study paintings, we're talking about studying paintings of the masters. So I don't know if there's much of anything. There's comparative stuff. You can see how impressionists work with close-ups and things like that. Um, you can see starts and how those are different from one painter to the next. Uh, there are various things like that that you can pick up, but mostly by comparison with other painters. Um, I mean, the right thing to do with, to, is, is to study paintings, unless you are just trying to paint to the internet. And there is undoubtedly such a thing as painting for, for the internet. I see a lot of images these days, uh, political type stuff, uh, Trump uh, you know, uh, turning him into a, 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 a fighter or a boxer or I mean, whatever, a, 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 <laughs> you know, a knight or something or other. Um, and it's obvious those things, I have no idea how well they're painted, but on the internet they, they work. Uh, who knows how, but you certainly wouldn't be able to be studying those things on the internet to figure out how to use a paintbrush. I'm already saying you said, these are so such self-evident things, you know, I'm not, I don't even know that I should talk much about this. Are not painters in some of, there's a third one here, is are not painters some of the very few human beings that remain engrossed in direct organic human sense? Now that, David, is a summary point. That's really the one where you want to get to your next question. Yes, we are. Are not human sensations from nature and from life one of the most powerful element, elements of living experience? Yes, yes it is. And what we do with paint, as I say, the marks that we make is something that is, that is part of the value of the painting. For those kinds of reasons that we're communicating sense to sense, you see my marks, you see the evidence of my hand in there. So it's not just the image and a story or narrative. You know, the illustrator has that advantage in the fact that as I show early in, in a minute, uh, that he's telling you a story, just narrating something essentially, and it, the, the, everything about the paint becomes a very secondary thing. Um, should not this uh, should this not inspire painters to paint what the camera can't see? Yeah, yeah, that's a whole different discussion. Of course, painting from cameras, you take photographs and then you paint from them. 
Portraits Incorporated has done a real disservice to American portrait painting. Um, you'd have to look at a wall again to compare a wall of paintings done from photographs and a wall in the same wall of paintings done from life. Look at a Velasquez, for example, and then look at almost anybody painting today, and you, you, you there's there's something very um, very different in, in in what you in the connection. It, Rem, uh, Rembrandt's the same way. I think one of some of the reasons we like people like Sargent who who you know, move the paint and where the brush marks can be seen and all that sort of stuff is because of photography. Um, it's, it, you know, we can see evidence of the human hand and of the human mind at work. So, um, yeah, and that's an all, you know, with a, anyway, we go on and on. I, I'm just going to talk about these particular paintings that are here, and I thought it was going to be fun if I just took you, I, I happen to be looking, I was thinking about doing a video just on an American Thanksgiving, but uh, if you get this on, you should get this on Thanksgiving or the day after. Uh, Thanksgiving in America is a is a celebration that the likes of which is greater than probably anything for most people more than th more than Christmas, and I don't mean because of the Christ issue story, but just simply because it's this wonderful feast day that doesn't doesn't involve this you know, but it's more about family and doesn't involve the attachment of uh, of presents and Santa Clauses and uh, and other things, church services even. Um, Jenny Augusta Brownscombe is a very interesting story. I think she was, I think she was born around 1850 or so. So, but, um, but she was actually the, a woman associated with the creation of the Art Students League in uh, 1905 or something like that. I didn't know that. She was one of those women who went over to France and studied over there. Um, oh, I should be able to tell you who she worked with. Oh, it's sad. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. But there she is, like 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 um, forty some years older than Gamel, older than the Boston School guys by fifteen years or whatever, somewhere in that range. Um, but here you can plainly see three different uh, colored paintings. Her paintings. Now, before I go any further, this one here has obviously been cropped. Uh, this one, I guess, too. Look how much more sky there is. So what cameras can do, I and mean, what the what the internet's been doing is stretching images. And yeah, that's something that's easy to miss on, but you'll, that stuff distorts the comp, the drawing, it distorts the composition, has all sorts of negative effects. But possibly to me the most um, pernicious one in terms of studying this kind of work is, you know, did, did this person paint an autumnal orange picture? This is a post from a postcard, by the way. Or was it a, or was the light, backlight, the atmospheric light like this? Or was it more inky like this? But which one is it? Now, by the way, one of the things I've said before is sometimes the internet produces an image that's even better than the one in nature is by chance. And in theory, you could mess with your own stuff that way and try to find best, uh, some, some sort of <laughs> alternative I, yeah, um, uh, color schemes and things like that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. I've, I've thought anything like that through. I probably shouldn't even say it, but the, but the, but this is just an example of the immediate thing that happens uh, right away. This is a cooler picture by a lot. That's halfway in between. This is a hot painting. I mean, those are three wildly different paintings. What could you learn from those guys about the color palette that the guy used, for example, uh, the woman used? And <clears throat> this guy, J.L.G. Ferris, her, his father was a student of Jerome's, I guess, and... Um, JLG is literally John Leon Jerome <laughs> Ferris, uh, but he painted maybe a hundred American history type paintings, and this is one of his, where exactly the same thing has happened without apology, right? And maybe this one is even cropped too, but you can see the bucket is cropped in this one. Uh, and again, these images, see all the trees are cropped completely out, the building is cut down, right down to about this level. Um, you can see that this is a wildly cooler picture. You can see this one is a fuzzier picture. It's out of focus, maybe, a little bit. And this one looks like it's, uh, it's, it's, and one of the things that photographs do in a way in the modern photographs is rather miserable to me is they hyper contrast. They create hyper contrast. And that gives a feeling that little, littleness of marks, the littleness of, uh, of detail is characteristic of the painting. That's definitely something you couldn't learn from a, from looking at these things. Um, you know, breadth is a very difficult thing to pick up when somebody's exaggerating contrast. So um, now here's Landecker. 
remember the um, the uh, the American um, uh, Thanksgiving uh, is based on the I guess Plymouth Colony story. Thanks to the Indians, this group of of uh, of, um, of uh, Europeans came over. Thanks to the Indians, they survived. That, uh, went the, the first winter, the crucial winter. They didn't seem to know much of what they had to do. A lot of them were just simply refugees. Uh, so that story, you know, there's there was a a famous Thanksgiving. It really did happen, where Indians did get together with the uh, with the Puritan uh, forefathers. And um, so <laughs> these kinds of stories, this is this very makes it picturesque, the, the Indian and the, and the um, in this case, the fat <laughs> Puritan. <laughs> uh, uh, what was this guy's name? Was it Squanto? I um, uh, wish I could remember the name of the Indian that really went out of his way to help. Even wound up, I think, going to Europe, maybe if I'm not mistaken. In any case, though, you're seeing this in context of a, of a where it actually wound up on a, on a, on a a magazine cover, the Saturday Evening Post, and here's a different version where it's far less white, far less lit. Now, which one of these is true? This one, the darks and light, the contrast is greater. Um, you can see the details, but again, there's a relative blueness to this one, a relative warmerness. If you just look at the baskets to this one, this is not, it's not reliable at all. Now, as David says, the shapes are still there. Um, their significance in relation to each other might be dimmed or might be affected by, you know, like an exaggerated highlight or something like that. They might, the whole composition might be affected by that. So that's another one of those things you can't know. I'm not, by the way, not trying to tell you how to, how to manage to use a picture because I don't think you ought to use one. I think you, but I do think you want to find out how to maintain a, the unity of your own impression as the basis of your beginning to even do an imaginative work like this. Landecker was, um, I think he was born in the 1870s, um, all before, well, that would have been the, after the Boston School by a little bit. Um, Ferris, I think, was, oh, golly. Ah, I wish I could tell you. I, I, honestly, I've lost that one. I don't, know where, I don't know what his dates are. When you get to N.C. Wyeth, um, Wyeth was born in the 80s, the 1880s sometime. But look at these two. Look at the vagueness of this one here, very washed out and all that sort of thing. And look at this one, very rich. Um, you know, the, the camera can juice them up. It can take the life out of them. You can see that even in movies sometimes. Uh, so which one, is, which one is the one you're going to learn from N.C. Wyeth from? It doesn't mean that at times a more wistful look like this is being conveyed and projected. And that's why I say there's no reason not to have that ability when you're making illustrations to adjust your, your image that you're going to have them use uh, if you find it's more expressive of your, of your storyline, which is what the whole thing is about anyway. Uh, but if you're trying to understand N.C. Wyeth's, I don't know which one of these is, is more true. My suspicion is that it's neither one, but maybe this one, based on what I've seen in person. I don't know why this is a vignette, so it must have been to do with the way the thing was used, but again, you can see that somebody has cropped it differently so that it isn't a vignette. Now, it's a finished picture. It's been cropped at the ends. You can see way over that tree right there uh, is the end now of this picture, so they're trying to use this in the carrying of this thing as the center of interest. Maybe it is over here a little bit too, but she's past center traveling out, out of the picture. So the whole composition is altered in significant ways. It does affect the color scheme. The oranges over here are definitely part of the, of the distribution of the oranges, uh, the way it was designed, and so on. But yeah, you can see the chroma is just lost, tons of chroma, if this is, if this is the, sec the, the least of the two, <laughs> or has chroma been added. One of the things I don't like about modern photography is how the f photographs tend to <laughs> juice up the reds. I don't know what that is. Norman Rockwell painted several, um, um, and I, I want to say he was born, uh, when was he born? He was also born before Gamel, but how much before? Whew, I don't know. Um, but photography by this time was heavy in, in his work. The use of it for, trace, you know, the, it looks like he's literally traced, image, traced uh, things. Um, but again, you can't see much. This, this is all totally washed out. The lights are really washed out. They've changed. All, the whole picture is warmer, and everything is about the featuring of these 
people here in a wholly different way. The, the life in the chroma here, look how different it is from this one, which is true. You can't tell. There's no way in the world to tell. Uh, why do you want to know which is true? Well, if you're trying to learn from somebody, you want to know what he really did. Um, there are things that happen in paintings that reproduce better. They say certain painters work, see, it looks better in photographic reproductions frequently. And uh, so for that reason, you might like to know what somebody did in their, in their actual work too. But, but you can see a real color back here in the background. You can see her, her she isn't wearing a faded dress in this picture. She's wearing a decidedly blue dress. Um, and so it goes. Again, the exaggeration of contrast. You know, this, this stuff stays together as a unit much better than this does. Much like this is all break, broken up now because of the, um, the way it's been interpreted by the camera. And then there's this one, which is so obvious, the uh, distortion of the circle, Thanksgiving, as well as the chroma right off the top. Now, I don't, people do this online, they play jokes on you. And, but, uh, so they managed to take a woman here that looks like she's maybe a little too fat for the circle, but maybe that's, maybe that's good. And here they just squeeze the painting. And uh, again, this one's now warm and very rich. And this one is much more average to a painting. <laughs> And the center is the richest portion of this one up here. It's out here, maybe the underarms or certain parts of the face, whatever, but wildly, wildly, wildly different. So what, yeah, so that's a big question. What in the heck can you use these for? You know, I don't go that way. If you're trying to study painting, study paintings in person. It's the most important thing you could do. Uh, and on 1905 was another uh, woman, Doris Lee, uh, when did she study? She was born in 05. That was, I, was, I think that was the same year as the establishment of the Art Students League. Um, her drawing does show the falling apart that's going on in American art and across the world as they, as they, uh, as they drawing becomes um, obstructed by the approach to painting that the administrators are now taking to running, running these places like the League. Uh, but nevertheless, this one is another one of these clear examples of distortion in several ways. One of them is this is a taller picture, and yet all the same content appears to be in it. So has this one been squished up? Is this, you know, are the figures squished down? So that's one. I think that's true that that's, maybe, maybe it's my eye, but I think this is flatter, uh, flatter for its width. But this is obviously full of green. This one is much more neutral uh, that way. Now, this is like a like a green a, a green is sat, you know travels through the entire painting and this one it's much more of a blue to blue gray traveling through the painting the pinks in this one are richer the, anything with red in it appears to be richer in this one here uh, the pinkiness is the floor actually somehow or other manages to be I said that backwards didn't I <laughs> the reds are richer in this one um, so there's something that can go on that way, just the deformation toward one color over the other. So you, if you bring out the reds, and that is a conversation you hear from people. Who knows what you wind up with? But I'll end with a couple other uh, more obvious ones that are just to do with color, and that is these are three images easily available online. I don't think any of these three is really what Degas did. I don't, I don't think any of them are even close. I will honest, I mean, I'll admit to you, I have not seen them. I'm guessing these things are... 30 by 40, roughly, maybe, in that range, uh, just based on their pastels I've seen. And uh, they could be smaller or bigger. I don't know. But, but I mean, how can you, how can you get this color scheme from, from orangey-greeny to cool-greeny to purple as the base color? <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it is ludicrous. Yeah, there's no question about it. It's just ludicrous what the camera does. Uh, I'm not looking closer at these pictures, but similar things happen in other ways. You know, the, as I said, the contrast, um, like the, 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 the hyper outlining that seems to be happening in ones like this one, where the whites all of a sudden become white, white, white. Uh, but they seem to be pushing the darks at the same time. What a, what a, what a wild world, you know. Um, <laughs> So, David, part of the answer to the question, though, is you can still pick up the beauty of the relationships that have the green or the distribution of the greens. In this case, those things become blues, but you can see that. But you can see it, you can't see it as well here because it's not as apparent. But but the whole thing about the pinks and the play, the interplay of the pinks to oranges and the way they play to the mountains, that's 
over here when the mountains turn yellow, we had a whole different discussion going on. So that distortion almost becomes, that, that also becomes useless. You can still in all cases see the, the construction of the patterning of the legs, the, the amusement that, that Degas derives from that, and that goes toward making up his composition. You can see to some degree the, the uh, busyness but I, this is again one of those exaggerations. The contrast is making the grasses look grassier, more more textural, and that creates all sorts of other weight burdens for the rest of the painting. So I don't know. I, <laughs> how do you want to leave that discussion? I'll leave you with Tarbo. This is a straightforward example, um, and I don't. I still don't know the answers I've already given. Um, I don't know how to use photograph. I don't learn from photographs so to speak. On the other hand, there are things you can learn. Um, you know, the, the designing, the designing of this sort of pattern, this sort of thing here, something that you see as far back even as, um, as Durer and others, that's not going away. The difference is in the strength of those things. You know, uh, in one of them, the, the, the cast shadows may look stronger in relation to these. And, uh, you know, uh, in, or this may look too strong in relation to whatever. It's hard to tell. Um, but there's there's so much other information. For example, how busy are the marks through here? How much, text, much texture is that? Or how smooth is it? These are big deals. How much, how broken is the water? Or how smooth is the water? So you don't even know what he, what he, um, how he, you don't know Tarbell by looking at these pictures. Let's put it that way. But compared to other painters, you can know Tarbell. You know, and that is a thing. It's, 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 it's at least something about different kinds of painting. You can see this is a lot more like a Monet, this broken color thing, than it is like a, like a Jerome uh, or, or Bouguereau. But again, you can see this is a warm picture. This is a, a uh, these two are cooler, but, but, but this one is, this one is, um, well, let me put it this way. This is almost washed out with being so brilliantly lit. The darks here, the whole thing is much more of a middle tone. The general tonality of this picture is different. Like the general color is warmer here. The general tonality of value of this picture, you see this whole body of water here is significantly darker than this one here. Still the relationships would, would stay, in theory at least, or would they? But again, the camera can distort that. So here the grass is very, very rich. And is it, you know, the greens now appear to be rich, relatively speaking, in this one. And, and so it's gonna keep going. Uh, yeah, don't judge the painters. I think maybe the last thing I could end with is just don't judge these painters harshly because of what you see online. <laughs> but don't also make more of their work, and especially that this modern day, the work that comes out by, by people who aren't particularly good. Uh, see this stuff in person before you, before you sell their work or, or denounce their, <laughs> their work. Or maybe I should better say, take it as an example or take it as a... Uh, of, of, well, an example of what to do, or is this an example of what not to do? So, but that's just the run through. You know, I, I do believe this stuff is more self-evident than anything else. You know that you're painting. But David, let's have another discussion another day, and I think you do it in maybe another question, about the value of the paint itself, the person, the hand, the evidence of the hand, the fact of the object, like it is an artifact. It's not just an image. It's an artifact. It's actually a, an object of art. It's a it's a craft piece, and um, and does that mean something? How much of that is sig really significant? Um, in impressionism, it you know, it, in some ways, it got demoted, and one of the reasons Gamel had to talk to us <laughs> about this quality of our surfaces um, it had to do with the idea that if you stood back ways and, and it looked true, it all it's all that mattered, and then you get up a little tiny bit closer, and the paint was off putting or lacked an aesthetic quality um, that an object would have wanted to maintain. There are a lot of paintings, I'm thinking of some, an Emil Carlson or two that I saw recently, that had such beautiful, beautiful qualities in the skin of the painting. And that's, a, but that's a discussion of a different sort, right? But it's a matter of, it's consideration, isn't it? Because you are creating an object out of paint on a canvas, on a board. And uh, so, what is the relevance of all that sort of stuff? But yeah, so my, my final point is that you probably can learn from these, from reproductions online. You can see the, 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 the way Rembrandt 
went from being this kind of a painter evolving into that when you could see the same thing with Velasquez you can see the, the you can see the history of painting has as certain things developed from say pre-renaissance right through the renaissance up till today you can but you know with this wonderful side by side thing you can see the evolution of 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 uh, of information of um, skills and things like that so there's lots you can see but if you asked about a single painting online and said can i copy that and make use of that to learn from i'm as hard pressed as david to not know precisely what to tell you what can you learn from that um if to the degree you can get one that's the you know that's pretty proximal to nature uh, you can use it for judging um, uh, certain kinds of relationships, especially those that appertain to um, to composition. But you do have to be hugely aware of of the um, you know the cropping thing that we talked about. You know this this is a way you see this is cropped right 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 just above this here, and right here. So they've cropped out. You know, she it's close to half the painting is missing. And they've done the same thing on both sides with the idea of featuring the children in the middle, which for illustration purposes is, is, is obviously something you might do or for, for uh, trying to preach about something that a painter is doing, you can talk about it. What we do online is primarily about based on using an image as a, as a platform from which to discuss ideas rather than to make us copiers of some specific thing that a guy is actually doing in paint. So if you keep that, remembering that, I can show you methodologies. I can show you differences in methodologies by showing you images. I can show you steps in evolving a painting. And that's all that stuff is obvious, is obviously communicable. Um, so uh, by, by means of the internet. Even when I do my, my own images, um, when I'm doing a demonstration and their images are shot every hour or two or something like that, it blows my mind how different the shots are coloristically, just coloristically, sometimes values too, from each other. And someday you line them up and you just have to take for granted the viewer is going to have to accept that somebody, you know, some other thing got behind the paint, you know, got in the background somehow and it changed the entire behavior of the camera shot, even though it was the same camera. But so it's in that category of things. And you'll just have to work that out. So just be thoughtful, beware. I think David's uh, would be a, a word of the wise, just beware. Uh, don't take don't try to take things from paintings that you can't take as much as I'm saying the barg the barg drawings are not the real you know unless you're dealing with those big boards you know you don't really know what barg's drawings are you're dealing with something else it's it's conceptual it's an idea about those drawings that you're working with um, there's stuff in those drawings that you're doing but there's a bunch of stuff that you're not aware of that he's doing and he makes certain kinds of things happen because of the medium he's using. And if you're using a pencil versus a charcoal, um, there's there are things you're assuming are so that may or may not be so. So, yeah, let's, let's leave it at that, uh, David. <laughs> I haven't frozen to death. I do, uh, for anybody who's seeing this today um, uh, on Thanksgiving in the United States, I wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. And... Uh, uh, I hope that uh, I can convey the gr gratitude I have for all you guys who have been supporting w what I've been trying to do and who have been uh, getting back to me about it. And it's I'm very gratified by both the dollars and the and the conversation that you guys bring. And the um, you know we're sort of a team now, um, you all and I, and uh, and I'm hugely appreciating it. So I always wanted to say thank you for. As Gamble said to me once, and some of us around him, he said, thank you for being there. So giving thanks is a good thing. So a happy Thanksgiving to everybody in the U.S. and out. I wish you well. Have a great week and see you next time.